Hey everyone, Thrasher here. Now hopefully you can see me in the bottom corner of your screen as we have a bit of a technology upgrade. In this video, we are still talking about rotation and we're still talking about cousins. We've been spending all these videos in this R series looking at how pretty much the physics we've learned about before is related and can be applied to things that are rotating. Just we got to look at these cousins, these slight tweaks for a rotating frame of reference. We're continuing that now with work and energy. So that's the focus of this video. Let's jump right in. The first part, part A of our notes, we're going to look at the work done by something that can rotate. And this image I have right here, this is a pulley. If we need to label it, we can. I definitely recommend you, you sketch out this diagram in your notes. And this pulley has a string wound around it over and over again. I drew a little bit of it right here. And we have a mass that's hanging down from one side. Now, classically, what we would kind of say, we'd approach this problem is we'd say like, okay, we're holding on to that pulley. We're going to let it go. Let's see what happens. I actually don't want to do that first. Right now, I actually want us to think about what happens if we were to grab that pulley and crank it like that. Okay, so imagine now I'm holding on to that pulley. I'm holding on to it right over here. And I'm going to pull it down. What's that going to do to this hanging mass? Well, hopefully I don't need an animation to show you, but it's going to make this mass start moving up, right? It's going to wind up that string and it's going to really apply a force on this mass. It's really coming from like the tension, uh, but the, the string is attached to the pulley. Uh, the, the string is also attached to the mass, but there's going to be a force acting on this mass. Is that mass going to travel some displacement, some vertical change in position? Absolutely. It's going to travel some H or some delta Y. So this pulley, my first couple bullet points right here, the pulley is able to do work on the hanging mass. I grab that wheel, I crank it by that pulley spinning, by it spinning around and around, it's able to do work on that hanging mass. Okay, that's probably pretty straightforward. Do you remember how sometimes we would talk about like, if I push or if I do work on the table, the table can do work on me? Well, it's going to be very similar in this situation. The next set of bullet points is our cousin version. Now let's go back to our original setup. If I had this hanging mass and I was holding on to it, I was maybe holding on to the wheel and the hanging mass, and then I let it go, well, the force of gravity is acting on this hanging mass. It's going to make it want to go downward. Let me delete this and let me delete this. And if the mass is going to move downward, what's that going to do to the pulley? You could probably guess it's going to make that pulley start rotating. It's going to start moving some delta theta. And is this mass applying a torque onto the pulley? Absolutely, or at least it's applying a force, right? It's applying a force downward. It's tangent to my, uh, my circle, and it's acting at some r away, some radius away. So the hanging mass can do work on the pulley. It can apply a torque. That's the cousin of force. And it can make this pulley undergo some rotational displacement or some angular displacement. Oh, so we still have work for things that are rotating. So let's write out our equation. And let me remind you first at the top in red, this was our old version for translation. When things are physically moving, to have work done, you need force and you need displacement. Well, for rotation, well, we're not going to derive it. The equation is very similar. We're dealing with cousins. So what's the cousin of force? Ah, that's torque. And what was the cousin of linear or translational displacement? That's angular displacement. So here's our new equation, the work being done to make something rotate. Well, you can do it. You need to apply a torque on an object, and that object has to undergo some angular displacement. So that's our new form of work for rotating things. All right? Well, hmm. I have this animation here. Again, I don't know if it's super necessary to, to get the point across that this pulley is going to start rotating. I do want to think about something, though. Okay, I'm going to start my animation. Okay, so here's the force. There's no hanging mass in this animation, but there's a force acting down. And let's watch this pulley. It's spinning. Now, what's happening to the speed of this pulley over time? Well, it doesn't have a great acceleration. It is speeding up. Hopefully, you see it's going faster and faster. This is going to stop in a second. But when you're applying a torque, of course, something's going to accelerate. When I reset this, we think of this pulley. Do you think it has energy? Mm. 
it does have energy. And it seems like its energy is increasing. Even without a formal definition, something's happening to it, right? It's going faster and faster. This work that's being done is changing the energy of our pulley. And if you're not convinced just by this hand wave, yeah, look at the animation, remember our work energy theorem. The work energy theorem says if net work is done on an object, it experiences a change in kinetic energy. And we just saw in our last slides that you can apply or you can have work done on rotating things. So there has to be a change in kinetic energy. But wait just a second. Is this pulley ever translating? Is it ever moving from one side to another? Oh, no. So it's not a kinetic energy in our old sense, because our old version of kinetic energy, that's when something is moving. It's going from one position to another. It's translating. There must be another type of kinetic energy. And that's what we're looking at right here, part B, rotational kinetic energy. Back to this animation when I reset, it starts at rest. And now it starts rotating. It's not only spinning, it's spinning faster and faster. There's an energy associated with angular velocity, this rotational speed. So let's look at that. Our old version, let's write down, just as a reminder, our old translational form of kinetic energy, K equals 1 half mv squared. Now, we used to just write K, and that was fine. But now we are going to look at two different types. So I'm going to put K T for translational kinetic energy. Ah, the cousin, rotation. Again, we're not going to derive it. You could look it up if you're interested. It's a bit beyond the scope of our course, so I'm just going to give you the equation. It is on the AP Physics 1 equation sheet. K rotation, it's a cousin. So let's think of cousins again. What's the cousin of 1 half? Ah, it's 1 half. Ooh, for our old version of kinetic energy, it was the inertia of the object. What's the cousin of our linear inertia? It's that rotational inertia. Ah, that's why we had to study rotational inertia in prior videos. So it's I here, that mr squared. And you know, there's maybe some fraction based on the, the shape of the object. What's the cousin of linear translational velocity? It's angular velocity. Here is our new equation. Aha, the rotational kinetic energy is based on 1 half the rotational inertia of the object, and that angular speed, that rotational speed squared. Now, so here I have a diagram. I just have a ball. It's super easy. It's not speeding up. It's not slowing down. But I have like a ball or a disc that's spinning. It's rolling across the table. So as this object is rolling across the table, does it have translational kinetic energy? Yes, it's translating, right? It goes from here to here. Is it undergoing rotation, or does it have rotational kinetic energy? It has to. If it's spinning, if it's rolling, it has rotational kinetic energy. So if you think of like a bowling ball, if you think of you take an object and you roll it down the floor, it has both translational and rotational kinetic energy. Now, if you're interested, if you're thinking of maybe like what forces are happening on this object, uh, on this diagram, that's a great question. We're going to look at that a little bit later. Okay, rolling is pretty interesting. It's complex, it's a little unintuitive, but right now we're just focusing on the energy of it. Okay, now last slide, we're just about done. Oh, and we're just gonna introduce this. We're just gonna look at the equation, and in a future video, we'll look at some of the concepts involved. We can still apply conservation of energy now for things that are rotating. As a reminder, conservation of energy, we have that the initial energy is equal to the final energy. Ah, okay. Well, what are possible energy something could have? Well, you know, we said like it could have some gravitational potential energy. Uh, you know, depending on the scenario, maybe it has, oh, oh, part of my diagram showing up. Oh man, ignore that for right now. It could have some spring potential energy. If something is translating, of course, it could have some of our regular old kinetic energy, but let's be careful. That's translational kinetic energy. And now what could an object do? It could also be rolling. It could be spinning. It could be rotating. So we have a new term that could possibly be in our equation. Remember, I have all these knots, these zeros, because that's the energy in the beginning. 
And we can compare that to the energy at some later point. As long as there's no non-conservative forces or non-conservative torques, that total energy must remain the same. So some final gravitational potential, plus some final spring energy, plus some final translational kinetic energy, plus some final rotation. Remember, like one of these in particular could change. UG naught could be different from UG, but the total amount of energy needs to stay conserved. I'm gonna bring up my animation uh, one last time. I have another example. Here I have a rolling object, and notice it's starting at some height, some UG, and when I hit go, when it's running, come on, technical difficulties, if it's running, ah, it's converting some of that gravitational potential energy into now two types of kinetic energy. It's translating and it's now rotating. Ooh, that gets a little complicated. Like I said, another video uh, will actually uh, elaborate on this a little bit. Let me actually get rid of that, and let me show you a, uh, uh, like an ice cube sitting on a ramp. Now, when that goes, this is like our old version. Is this object rolling? No. So all that UG is turning into translational motion. But now we have a more complicated scenario. We could just do the straight up math. Uh, that's kind of going to be our focus right now. And then we're going to look at the concept of that a little bit later. So I have a diagram. I do recommend you, uh, you add it, um, you know, at least in the beginning. Just this idea of we can compare energies before and after. So maybe in the beginning, something is rolling. It has some V naught. It has some omega naught. Maybe it has some H naught. And then maybe, you know, it, it's almost like a projectile. It could fall down and maybe it keeps rolling. So we can just apply this conservation of energy again before and after. Okay, we'll see some math practice, and in the next video, uh, we'll look at rolling objects, a little more specifically for the physics of what makes an object roll, and we'll look at some concepts of energy. Oh my gosh, thanks for watching. That's my video.